as we're going through life or making plans and making goals, it has to start with the right view of God. Your, your view of God is what everything comes down to. Jamie, it's so great to see you. Welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, man. Good. Glad to be back. Good yeah. Good to be back with you. It's uh, it's always a fun conversation. I texted you a bit ago and really just asked what's been on your heart lately in the realm of spiritual formation. Here we are, 2024, in the Spiritual Formation Series. And Jamie, you said the Beatitudes. And so one of my favorite things to do with you is just to set a target and let you flow. So take this wherever you'd like and teach us. We're ready to go. I'm eager to learn. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, what well, was interesting, yeah, going in, you know, going into a new year, I like, I like, that kind of thing. I like thinking about the new year and goals and new beginnings and all that stuff. I like it a lot. So going into the new year, <clears throat> I've been thinking a lot about focus and we've been meeting with a group of 20 to 30 year olds here mm. in our city and um, we're going to spend the year together. And so one of the things we were talking about is, is, um, as we're going through life or making plans and making goals, it has to start with the right view of God. If you don't have, if you have your, your view of God is what everything comes down to. So I can ask a person, you know, if they're not from a faith tradition, I might say, when you think about the universe, do you think that the universe is for you or against you? That what's your sense in life? And the majority of people I talk to at some level think that it's kind of against them, that they're, that they're kind of in an uphill battle, a struggle. And, and then, and then if I have talked to believers, a lot of believers, although they wouldn't say God is against them, but they would, they wouldn't necessarily see God as for them. It's kind of interesting the way, you know, is like, well, I'll be talking to them and, and, um, asking about their view of God and, and a lot of, a lot of in the 20 to 30 year old group, but a lot of us were raised with a view of God, that God is, you know, disappointed in some way, or that the beginning of the relationship is built on, we've dropped the ball, we failed. So we're beginning as failures and trying to come into some kind of reconciliation with God. And so, um, so it's like, we're, we're proving ourselves to God or, or, you know, God's got a lot of things to be frustrated with us about. We're doing the best we can, that kind of thing. So, so we've been working on really the great commandment, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, love your neighbor in the same right way that you love yourself. So we broke up our year is going to be love God first. What does that mean to love God? And what does it mean to love yourself? And then what does it mean to love others? If you don't love yourself, you'll never really love others. Uh, so if you, have a, if you have a view of God, a right view of God, then you can form a right view of yourself. If you have a right view of yourself, then you can form a right view of others and you see the connection and the flow it just goes in a constant flow. So, um, so a right view of God. So what's the right view of God? How do you love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength if you if you can't see God, <laughs> right? And so you can't see God, and so God is this mysterious um, one whose ways are not our ways, maybe, and who's distant and, and maybe isolated. Um, so the beauty is we have Jesus. So we can see Jesus, and Jesus is the exact representation of the invisible God. So that's the beauty of Christ, is that when we see Jesus, we are seeing God. And the idea is not that Jesus is like God, that's true, but the really astounding thing is that God is like Jesus. So to, just to meditate on that, God is like Jesus. It's not like I was raised, God is the bad guy, Jesus is the good guy kind of thing. And so so the, the, the challenge in that is if God is, you know, not friendly towards us or loving towards us, but he's more fear producing, it's hard to love something you fear, right? 
not to love something you're in awe of, that's possible, but to love something you're afraid of is, is difficult. So when we look at Jesus, we can see, oh my goodness, that's, that's what the Bible says is the exact representation of the invisible God. So if God is like Jesus, that, that, then, then that's the one who's saying, come unto me, all you are heavy burdened, cast your cares on me. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve you. If that's God saying that to humanity, that's dramatically different than I need to spend the rest of my life serving God to make God happy. Rather than I'm serving because God has served me and loved me, now I can turn and serve and love others. Like that beautiful organic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, like that. So, so as we focus on Jesus as the, the image of the invisible God, then I think the place to go in the scriptures then is the Beatitudes. Because... The, the gospel, Matthew 5 through 10, is really kind of what does the kingdom of God look like? If we're walking in the kingdom, practicing the kingdom, then the, that's the passage, you know, how do you fast? How do you pray? How do you look at other people? All those things are in Matthew and in, in the Sermon on the Mount. And so the Beatitudes are like the introduction into the Sermon on the Mount, where, where Jesus is saying, here's sort of the Here's the preamble to the whole in-depth Sermon on the Mount. And then he teaches it like an Eastern teacher, not like a Western teacher. So he's teaching the Beatitudes as if they're like a progression to higher levels of understanding or higher levels of maturity in the kingdom. So that you start at this one level and you end up at this higher level. And at that high level is how you pray, know how to pray the right way and how you know how to fast at this level and how do you interact with enemies at this level is really powerful, right? And so, um, so the, the Beatitudes kind of have, they, they're, they're in one way of thinking them, they're, they're saying there's like four kind of things to think about. We call it, we, or like ways of life. Four ways of life. And then it gives it gives like a nine kind of step progression into those ways of life. So like one way of life is the way of surrender, right? The way of surrender. Well, there's actually, there's even more than that. I should say there's, yeah, there's, there's the way we would look at it is each beatitude is a way of life, right? So the way of surrender. So if it's okay, I'll just walk through them and just show you what, what I mean by that. Um, so when we're, so when we're growing up in the worldview that we are, most of us are raised in this separation worldview is the idea that there's not enough for everybody, um, that we have to be, we have to be certain about what we're doing in life because there's not enough job opportunities, there's not enough money and all that. So we have to really pursue certainty, which leads to a pursuit of perfectionism. You can't fail, which leads to just self-focus. My whole life, I just have to be self-protect and self-promote. And so we have these ways that we're taught to respond to life or certain postures. And so what Jesus is doing is he's presenting the worldview, the connection worldview, which is you're never separate. You're always connected. We're always connected to God, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. We're always connected to each other. We're always connected to the environment that we're in. We're never separate. The other night I met, a, there was a girl visiting our group, 20 year old new, new girl that came in and she said, she said in the prayer time, would you just pray for me? I'm, I feel very separate and distant from God. And it was interesting how they prayed for her. They prayed for her, God, would you move her out of the lie that she's separate and distant from God? Right? She's assuming that, you can be, and she's a believer, as a believer, distant and separate from God. And really what we're saying is that's never true, but it, you can believe you're distant and separate from God. But God is never distant and separate from you, never, right? 
So Adam and Eve in the garden, they believe because we did these things wrong, we're now separate from God and we have to hide from God and God's distant from us. But when in fact God goes and finds them, he's not trying to be separate. He wants to be with them. In the lie that they now believe, they feel separate. They feel ashamed. They feel unwanted. But God pursues them. So um, so in the, in the Beatitudes, it's this beautiful way of life that's built on connection and there's enough and life is a mystery and, and failure is part of learning and you can be other focused and love others and self emptying. So when we, so when we look at the Beatitudes, when it starts off and Jesus says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. This is sort of like the beginning level, the way of trust. Blessed blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the way of trust. And we call this getting empty, right? So when you first, the very first thing to, to do, even we, we do this every day, but when you come, you know, in your contemplative time, prayer time is like, you have to really just get empty of everything that is weighing you down because our first instinct in life, the way we're trained is, is, is to be, to have closed handed anxiety. Like, this what do you mean by that? Will you, yeah. D- double click on that, Jamie, closed yeah, so, handed so it's, anxiety. It's like, what does it mean? Like, this is all I have in life. I've got to hold on to it. Oh. You know, I got to hold on to it because I'm in constant fear of not having enough. That's where right. the scarcity mindset from the previous model that you were talking about, scarcity, certainty, perfectionism, self-protection, right? Right. right. So like, I've got this job. I can't uh-huh. lose it. I can't lose it. If I lose it, it's all over because there may never be another job, another opportunity. I've got this relationship. I got to hang on to it. It's not a great relationship, but it's the best I'm ever going to really see, right? I've got this little amount of money. I don't want to invest it because or risk it over here. Because, you know, there's not enough and everything's this closed handed hold on to it anxiety in life. Um, And it's kind of it's risk aversion. It's all of that, all of that kind of thing. Um, And what Jesus is saying in Get Empty, he's saying the new posture is open handed trust. That's the so the Get Empty is like, I'm going to open up my hands and I'm going to own my own poverty like i'm gonna own my own i'm just gonna be empty and i'm gonna open myself up and anything all this close handedness that prevents me from receiving from the lord i'm just gonna open it up and say i see myself as poor lord i want to receive all that you have for me that's really my first prayer of the day is lord is there anything in me that's preventing me from receiving all that you have for me? Yeah. Will you, Jamie, will you walk us through, you and I have talked for the last couple of years about self-emptying. That is exactly what what it is to be poor in spirit, but connect self-emptying and open-handed trust to like a practical model. What does that look like for you? I mean, you don't have to disclose your, your morning rhythm with the Lord, but for folks that are saying in this formation series, okay, Um, if this is one of the most important things I do and it starts with trust as we ascend and self self emptying is the way to get there, Jamie, how, how do I do it? Because my innate neurobiological reflex, dare I say the motivation of a broken spirit is closed handed anxiety. I'm a, I'm afraid of you're not going to come through. Therefore, here's a better way to say it. Proverbs says, Trust in the Lord with your whole heart. Lean not upon your own understanding. But what happens when we don't fully trust? It's like right. we're leaning a little bit of our back weight on just in case he doesn't come through. Exactly we can right. keep ourselves afloat. Right. Walk us through this this self-emptying uh, practice. And then yeah. obviously you just take it wherever you, you want well, to take there, it. I mean, there's so many examples of it. But like, so for me, I felt like... Um, Going into a new year, going into 2023, I was asking the Lord, I was saying to the Lord with my hands open, (laughs) I want to receive everything that you have for me in 2023, right? You you can't receive with your fists closed, holding on to something. You can't, 
I can't hand you anything. So it's opening up your hands. Well, then like the question is, well, what do you, what would you be, what you, what, what are you closed and hanging on to anyway? Like, what are, you, what are you protecting that you're afraid God might take or whatever? And so the Lord, the Lord, I felt like the Lord was inviting me. It's always an invitation because he's not going to force you, but he, inviting me in to, um, to opening up just to be honest with what we're doing, open up a little coffee shop here in the town we're in, which I don't know anything about and, and writing a screenplay. So, so that's something that I have to receive from him, that invitation. It's an invitation and invitations have to be received. Right. And so it's, if I, it's not like God saying to me, go start a coffee shop. <laughs> like, like he's, commanding me to go do something he's inviting me into something that he's gonna do that you're you're popping a huge balloon of a paradigm right now for people like me who are enneagram ones very driven achievement oriented and i mean just before you take us down the path a little more can you spend a little more time even on that the invitation versus the drive that's a different posture Right. Well, because see, so that that's the beautiful verse in Philippians. I think it is where it says, faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. First Thessalonians 524. Okay. Is the, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So like, so again, it's an invitation. He's inviting me, which means he's the one that actually does it. Close hand anxiety is like, I got to do it. <laughs> It's like God saying, go do this and good luck and let me know how it goes, which is how a lot of us feel. And then you're like, okay, thanks, God. And then you're on your own to figure it all out, right? And then you're Jeez. not, right? Then you're not empty at all, man. You are so burdened down. Now it's a weight that's thrown on you. So imagine, so imagine uh, Hebrews, like um, he's the author of, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter. That's it. Of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Why? Because he's the author of everything that you're being invited into, and he's the perfecter of it. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And we have this, we've been, you know, taught this separation, weird scarcity idea that God in, is just commanding us to do stuff. And then he's saying, like, like this. Uh, just quickly, I was, we were working on this um, script even today. And I was thinking of a time when I was a police officer in on the midnight shift, we would go out on the midnight shift. And I always stopped in this one Seven Eleven, you know, to get the coffee starting the midnight shift. And there's this one Vietnamese clerk in there all the time, woman. And she would, she'd try and talk to me, but it was like, she, I was, she was difficult to understand. And I, it was just too much trouble to listen to her, honestly. And so I was so consumed with my own stuff, I didn't pay attention to her. And one night, I get sent to this crazy, um, malicious wounding scene in this Vietnamese uh, neighborhood. And people are running around these apartments. I can't understand anybody. I finally, they're pointing to this one apartment. I go into this one apartment, and there's this woman that's been stabbed viciously. Um, and so I'm in there, and bloods all over the place and I'm like working with her and in, in um call the rescue squad and they come in and work out what happened someone had stabbed her and it's the clerk from the 7-Eleven it's the oh woman my gosh. and I and I recognize her face and I'm like thinking man I know I mean all the times that lady mm. tried to talk to me I never interacted with her because I was too had my own stuff mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. never talked to her about faith or eternity or anything and so the, the EMTs were taking her out and I was walking beside the stretcher and I said, is she going to live or die? What do you think? And they said, we don't know. He said, but the blood is, but be careful. Her blood is on your hands. And it just really hit me that passage in Ezekiel where it says, if you don't warn, you know, the wayward, the, their blood, I will hold their blood against you. Their blood is on your hands. And I was looking at my hands and it was her blood. And I was thinking, wow. Her blood is on my hands. And in a, in a way, that's the kind of guilt we carry. It's like, God's like, I got all these lost people out here. And if you don't win them, like I'm holding you responsible for it. And that's the word responsibility. It's like, we feel like God tells us to do something. And then he just gives us the responsibility. And then he's, 
He just waits to see if we can do it or not. And if we do it, okay, and if we don't, we're in trouble with him. It's just as soon as you think that way, the whole thing's a burden. The whole thing just becomes a burden that you have to carry and you can't receive from him anymore because you're just burdened with whatever it is, right? And so the idea, though, is Jesus, when he's, when he's calling the disciples, he's not saying, look, here's your job. Here's the responsibilities and expectations I have for you. Let me know how it goes. You, th- there's all kinds of bitterness and disappointment in that kind of commissioning. But that's not what he's doing. He's inviting them to follow him. <laughs> that's what he's doing. He's not giving them a job to go do. He's saying, follow me and I will make you to become. And they have to receive the invitation, not go do something. They have to receive the invitation and then they have to stay with him. That's the whole abide in me and my words in you and then ask whatever it is and it'll be done for you like that. Right. So the whole thing is like set aside all your own like the way it's supposed to go and all the the stuff that weighs you down. And so when he invites me in to say, follow me and I will want to start a coffee shop with you guys. Follow me and there's a screenplay I want written with me. Follow me and I will make you to become the person that can do that kind of thing. But you have to abide in me. And so when you start to follow you get distracted by different things, right? And you wow. start to think, oh man, this whole thing depends on me. Yep. And you stop and you get full of yourself in a way. And you stop receiving. And so, so like in the coffee shop thing or in the script writing, it's all about joyful relationships. And so when you start down the road following Jesus and you realize, oh, we gotta have this guy, but we don't really like this guy, and it's a difficult relationship, the Lord's like, Now you're taking it upon yourself to get the right people to make the thing. And you can tell because you lose your joy. And, and he keeps saying, he would say to the Lord would say to us, you don't need that person. I'm inviting you into this. I will tell you who else is invited into it. You don't need to go find the best resume to do it, which is, which is us. To just making everything our own responsibility and and we and building these expectations. And so then the way the Lord works it out is just so mysterious and beautiful. You can't write it. You can't predict it. Like there's no formula to it. That's the hard part. We want, okay, we're going to start a business. Here's the steps you go through to start a business. <laughs> the people that invested, we didn't even know them. We didn't even know who we I mean, we had people that we thought, okay, here's going to be the investors. Nope. Then we were like, oh, wow, we don't we don't even know who's going to invest in this thing. And then we're all worried and it's all, what are we going to do? And then, but so what I would do is just get up in the morning and get on my knees and say, Lord, I just want to receive everything that you have about this coffee shop. I just want to receive everything that you're inviting me into related. And then these people would, I mean, you would meet people and they're like, hey, we'd like to be an investor. And like, you never even knew him before, but it, these joyful relationships occur. Dang. And that's the kingdom, right? And so if you seek first the kingdom, then these other things happen. But a lot of that involves setting aside all of your own expectations and presumed responsibility and everything. And just how do we respond- do that? What's that? Yeah, like how do we do how do we do that? Because so many of us are programmed to go into our time with the Lord and I mean this is such an overly simplistic example, but prayer for many of us is a monologue, not a dialogue, not sitting, listening. I'm reading um or just finished taking my second or third read on Rollheiser's The Shattered Lantern, which I'm going to send to you. Uh it's such an amazing book and he talks exactly about this this posture of um, contemplative exercise like how do we know we're doing it when we're doing nothing we're actually just in a posture of receiving right that's so foreign to so many people Jamie yes. and then some people just throw it into the camp of oh that's woo woo right. that's new age that's secular or whatever um, and we're saying no actually the kingdom had it first right that's right what do you want to say about that how do how do we position ourselves to hear to receive so that we're not again driving our own expectations to something that the Lord's like, ah, gosh, I just want to talk. 
Yeah, well, I, I mean, to me, it come to me, it's always about joyful relationship because because you know, again, back to the picture of Jesus, nothing, in, nothing in the reality that we know, nothing changes unless it's in relationship to something else. It's all there always has to be something in, good or bad. You come into relation, object comes in relationship with something else, and it it affects that, and so. That's why we need Jesus, because Jesus, we can watch God coming into relationship with people and that causes a change to occur. So um, so it, for me, it's when God invites me into something, I know he's not interested in a coffee shop. He's interested in joyful human relationship and connectedness in community. That's what he's interested in. So if we get down to like all it is is about how much money and what's the investment in the coffee shop and all that. There's no re human relationship involved in that kind of thinking, and it becomes just this this utilitarian, you know, economic thing. And I mean, like immediately the joy just goes out of it. But when it like a a community of, of us that got together and said, you know, we really what we need is a place to to build community, and in this environment, we'll serve coffee when we build the community. Like the coffee is ancill ancillary to the community. And then so then the whole focus is like, how do we build great community? And some person, person says, well, we need a building. Well, then I'll invest in a building. And this, the relationships just pour, begin to pour into it with this kind of joy. And that's how, that's the only way I know to really understand it. So my prayer in the morning is, Lord, is there anything in me that's preventing me from receiving all that you have for me? Anything blocking me from receiving, I want to be empty of that. And it's usually fear. It's usually the thing that's blocking. It's I like, asked the Lord that question two days ago, and immediately I heard fear, Jamie. And that's like, I get that answer all the time. And my next question to him is, how do I get rid of it then? And then right. he's like, well, because you need to abide in perfect love. Perfect love, where there's perfect love, there's trust. You don't fully trust me in this area of your life, do you? Right. Well, what's interesting in the Beatitudes is when the question, okay, Lord, you know, I want to get empty. So bless, blessed are the poor in spirit. So you're moving from close handed anxiety to, um, to open handed trust. So that, so you're, you're, you're opening it. And then the next, the, um, is you, you, so this is kind of the prayer, Lord, my life is in you. I receive this moment as a gift. This is kind of how we pray. All that has been and what lies ahead remain a mystery to me kept hidden. But I trust in the love that spoke the world into existence. I say yes to whatever this day may bring. So I want to receive whatever this day may bring. Only let me see and cherish what is real, what is true. And then the next thing Jesus says is the way of lament, which is super fast. So get empty, right? Get empty and then um, get sad. I think this is uh, this is fascinating. So you're empty out every day. Just Lord, I just, I'm just, I just want to be empty of anything that prevents me from receiving all that you have for me. Then he says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. When I look at the world, what breaks my heart? Like, what do you want me to be sad about today, Lord? Right? And the things that that take away our peace and joy is we're mourning and lamenting the wrong things, right? We're sad because we don't have enough money. We're sad because somebody doesn't like us. We're sad because our job isn't, you know, the way we want it. We're sad for the wrong things. So you're going from, you're going from an instinct of you turn away from what's painful to facing it and asking the Lord, um, What's broken in me? What, what's broken in me that I need to be sad about? What's broken in the world that you want me to be sad about? So it's interesting when we're praying like about a coffee shop or writing a screenplay. It's like, what's broken in the world that this coffee shop brings comfort to, right? Or this screenplay or this whatever like wow, that. Wow, Jamie. And, and then what's, what's, pain, what's broken in me that the Lord wants to lament over today you know mm -hmm. we think about when jesus weeps when we see jesus show emotion what's he weeping about he's never weeping for himself 
right? He's always weeping because of who's around him and how they don't understand what's happening or they misunderstand. And they're in pain because they don't get what's going on. And he weeps for them. But most of the time when I weep, I'm weeping for myself. And so blessed are those who mourn. So Lord, what do you want me to lament? What about? What what what's broken in the world? Where do I see loneliness and pain or disappointment and loss in the world? And then where is it in myself? And 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 how do I be sad about this in a way that brings your comfort? I love that. And when we do this exercise with people, like, what does the Lord want you to be sad about? What does he want you to lament? It, it takes a lot of your eyes off of yourself, right? It's, and out, turns it outward. And so then we're sad. Then you become mournful for the, for the things in the world that Jesus is mournful for. But again, like I said, a lot of times what I'm sad about, what's causing anxiety in me is more about myself, the situations that I'm in, more than a kind of outward focus. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to face pain, face our own pain, and then face pain that's in the world um, that we can really do something about. Like, you know, I know your book's coming out and it, it's because of pain in the world that you oh, see. Exactly, it's also Jamie. pain you feel. Right. I'm reliving every word I wrote right now. You know, before I hit record, Jamie, I was telling you just the last few months of life have been chaotic and so painful. And I told the Lord and my counselor, I said, I feel like I'm reliving every word I wrote. And I'm like, <laughs> is that to make sure, you know, that I'm I'm truly this word is abiding in me, perhaps, you know, Um well, Jesus never, Jesus never presents any of this where he himself doesn't do it, right? He's not like just teaching off the top of his head. Everything that he's going to tell him to do, you know, turn the other cheek, all of that, he's going to do it at a level far deeper than even they will do. They're going to do it as well at a level they never dreamed of as they learn how to be sad about the right things and how to get empty of the things that are that are weighing them down that, that they don't that they're holding on to, they're going to move to a level where they're, where even death, the threat of death doesn't slow them down. But to get there, they have to get empty first. They have to be sad about the right things. And so if, like being sad about losing your life, Jesus says, you can't be sad about that. That can't be one of the things you're sad about because then you'll seek, to, then you'll close up and you'll seek to save your own life. Right. And so, 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 um, he who seeks to save his own life is going to lose it. That's what Jesus is saying. So let's get empty of that fear that death somehow is a loss and a failure. And like, because you're going to watch me do it and you're going to think we lost the whole thing and it's not true. It's the win. It's the glory. It's the passion, right? Shall I not drink the cup the father has given me? This is, the, this is why I came. It, the death is not something to be avoided. I, I'm sad that if I would be sad if I didn't die, how about that? <laughs> right. And, and, um, and so getting empty and then getting, getting sad for the things that, that the Lord made you to be sad about when you, it, it's interesting if you have a room full of people and you, and we do this prayer with them, like ask the Lord what he wants you to be sad about in yourself and in the world. They're sad about all kinds of different things. Wow. Some people are sad about human trafficking. Some people are sad about um, the marketplace. Some people are sad about foster care. And it just spreads out really beautifully across all the brokenness of the world. And all of us need to be sad for different things because it motivates us It's towards the injustices that make us sad. But when you know what God made you to be sad about or lament about, we need to go after it with everything we have, like your book, like probably that will never go away in you right at some level It'll oh jamie be... yeah i mean here's the case study and i'm so glad you said that because i told my agent this is before i had the book deal you know wrote the book and here we are it's mid-january and you know the book comes out in in eight weeks from approximately from now march 19th and um i remember telling her like 
I have to write this just because I have to write it. This message is, it's part of who I am. That's and right, exactly. I can't, I may have told you and Donna this years ago, but Jamie, like, I can't move off this one thing. I will give the rest of my life for this message of transformation. It's why I lose sleep over how incensed I am at the failures of the self-help industry. Um, yes. Why, you know, this is a lesson you've taught for years we keep looking down and in instead of up and out. Psalm 121, where does our help come from? I lift, I lift my eyes. I, lift, I look up. I look up. And so, yeah, you're exactly right. But w there's an aspect of this I'm curious your take on, which is if we're talking about mourning, this is moving into a level of intercession and co-laboring with the Lord, right? Like we're co-birthing his his desires for humanity, which requires emotional maturity on our part. Is there a back end step or heart piece of heart transformation that we can begin to allow the Holy Spirit to heal regarding self-centeredness, self-focus, um, that we can move beyond this step to, as you said, true kingdom mourning that we're interceding and co-laboring with the Lord to bring his desires to pass. Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, that's where, to me, the, for me personally, that's the get emptying part is the most critical part for me. It's like, what are the things that consume me that prevent me from mourning about anybody else or anything else? Yeah, that's the self-protection, self-promotion. It's like, that's the prayer. Like, Lord, what in me prevents me from receiving what you have for me or how you want me to think about things. What prevents me from having the eyes that you have for this? I want to be empty of that. I want to be free of that. Yeah. That's my, that's, if I can't do any step, that's the one I do. Like get empty, get Like I'm so burdened by all this stuff. Um, I just got to like get empty. When I was driving to church yesterday, a lot, a lot of these things were on my mind. And I felt, I said to the Lord, I feel like I have a head cold. I feel like I, it, stuff is clogged in my head and I can't just make it unclog. And I felt, I felt if I could put like a little drain right in my neck and let it drain out. And I, and I was sitting in the first worship set um, and they were singing Hark the Herald or something like that. And it was just, I could just feel it like draining out. <laughs> it was like... The Lord's like, I can empty you out. I, just if you're willing to be emptied, I can take it, right? You can cast it on me. I will take, you don't have to make it go away. I'll take it from you. And our penchant toward the independent spirit, though, to not release, like I think about this, and I wrote about this in my book. Um, he says to us, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And we're right. like, nope. And we, we hold a proverbial arm length at him so when he says come to me we turn around and run away that's right that's right we're we close up it's so interesting yeah instead of opening up we did this exercise in a company last week you know in a secular company and we, we call it the unburden we do the, the the beatitudes but we call it the unburdening exercise and the first step we we're doing you know imagine your, yourself you're in a safe place and unconditional love is present with you and there's like uh 20 people from this company and when they start unburdening it it is amazing to watch what happens to human beings when they actually visualize letting go of all the junk they're holding on to and people start crying Never fails. People start crying, especially when you ask them to say, you know, we make them say to the whole team, what, you don't have to say what the burden is, but just say what happens when you let it go. And all of them will say what the burden is. <laughs> like, and this could be private. And they're like, no, you know, and the, and the accountant, the, the um, CFO said, my personal finances are a disaster. <laughs> She's the CFO of the company. And she goes, I can make everything out here work, but I can't make my own personal finances work. And it's such a burden to me. I feel like an imposter every day. That's what she says in front of the whole team. And then she just burst into tears. And I said to her, why, why do you think you can't make your personal finances work out? And she said, because I, I, know how, I know the formula for doing it and the formula I'm doing doesn't work. And I don't know any other way. And I said, there's a hundred other ways to do it. But you have to let that one way go. <laughs> you wow. have to let it go. 
and then the other ways become apparent to you. Okay. Let me interject real quick because if we have to let this go, could I propose safely then that what we're letting go is the thing, but behind the thing is, and this is where we started. You were talking about scarcity, certainty, self-promotion, and self-protection. Yes. And so you're letting that go. You're, you're letting that whole lie-based thinking go. Because if, re- if I really got down to it with a person, you know, all the way back to what we we're saying, they would say, it's me against the universe. I'm losing like all this kind of thing. has to go mm. because, because that kind of thinking can't see real opportunity because it's outside. It's the purview of the one way we're certain is supposed to work. Jamie, I can hear people knocking on our door, so to speak. And what I don't want people to do is walk away from this conversation going, oh, it's it's a life hack. I, I just got to learn this behavior modification trick and I can step into it. This is going to be a little redundant, but but talk to the folks about what it takes, number one, to not approach this as a life hack, but instead yeah. position our hearts before the Lord for transformation to happen from the inside out so that we can, as Psalm 24 says, ascend the hill of the Lord with clean hands, a pure heart, because I love this. We're rejecting that, which is false. Right. Yeah. So, right. So, you know, Romans 12, submit the, the, the process is submit yourselves, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. That's what you're doing. That's not a hack. That's like the, the biggest challenge you'll ever do every single day through the day, um, which is your spiritual service of worship, right? It's not a job. It's a, it's an act of worship. You're just presenting the truth of who you are to God. So then you need to know the truth of who you are. So it's quite a bit of work. Um, and you, and then you keep drifting into the false all the time. So you have to keep coming back. It's a discipleship. It's a discipline. So you're submitting yourselves, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and do not conform any longer to the patterns of the world. That Because every day we're, we go right back into the ruts of the patterns of the world, right? So with the lady, the example I'm giving of the lady, um, she's saying, I... I, in my life, personal life, I can't afford to pay these bills. And she goes, and I'm an expert in finance. And I said, yeah, but you're you're applying how you run this company to your personal life. And I said, they're different things. And you're saying there's one way to do it. And that's the only pattern. And I'm conforming to it. And it doesn't work. So I said, so what you're going to do is let's lay aside that one way of doing it submit yourself and stop conforming to it and then be transformed by by the renewing of your mind then you will know the more excellent you know the way in which to walk so i just did it with her in front of the group and i said tell me the financial situation you're in i'm not a cfo that's but i do know how not to conform (laughs) and so i just walked her through and i said tell me that what you're doing to pay whatever those bills and she tells me and i said okay so let's set that aside ready let's give that away it's a burden Let's get empty of that strategy. Okay, now, now, like, lift your eyes up and look around. Is there another way? And she's like, well, we could, right? And, And just the freedom. So it's not a hack. It's like, you know, one way to get to the store and you get there is a roadblock there and you just sit there in your car and cry and never look at a GPS and go, is there another way? It's not a hack. Whoa. It's like there's 15 roads that go to the store, but you've only ever been on one. And so when that one stops, it's not because God's against you. He wants you to see how many roads there are to this. My like it's gosh, beautiful. Man. Yes. Right. Does oh that make gosh. sense? Yeah, it really does. Um, and, and you can continue if you want down the road of the Beatitudes. I had a quick question, though, because we were talking about self-emptying, which is related to poor in spirit. Each one of the Beatitudes has this outcome, if you will. Um, I hate that word in this context, but 
whatever, it'll work. Yeah. Those yeah, are, yeah. Th- those who are poor in spirit get the whole kingdom, Jamie. That's, That's right. huge. Exactly right. Yes. What's what's your read on that? I mean, <laughs> blessed are the mourn for blessed are those who mourn they get comforted. Blessed are the pure in heart they'll see God, but blessed are those who are poor in spirit they get the whole thing. Right. Why? Right. Because if you don't if you're not if you don't it's like in Philippians, you know, too, when it says Jesus emptied himself. He's the ultimate self-emptying example. Right? And he it says he emptied himself even, you know, not only to death, but death of, on the cross. So he didn't consider heaven something to be close-handed about, but he emptied himself. And so that's our model, right? He's, he's other-focused, self-emptying, unconditional love for his enemy. That's what he's doing. And so when he's talking through the Beatitudes, he's saying the process to be at that level of humanity where you always see God and where everything you do brings peace. Like he's telling you how to get to that place. Number one step, empty. How do you become the name above all names? Empty. (laughs) And, you know, there's that double meaning. It's like every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? Because he's the self-emptying one. Did he empty himself because he's the name of all names? Yes. Is he the name of all, above all names because he emptied himself? Yes. Both. Yes. Right. It's both. And so to self-empty is to open yourself up to receive all that's real and true. So when you empty yourself, now you can be sad about the right things. Now you can now you can direct all your passions in the right direction, meek. And what what is the meek? What is the one who directs all of their passions in the way of their lament? That's where they're directing. Why? Because they're empty of all the other stuff. Like now I know I'm going to lament this, and I'm going to direct all my passion towards bringing comfort towards this brokenness in myself and in the world. And what do you inherit? The earth. It's this. You and I'm telling people all the time. You want to inherit this? Direct all your passions toward what made God you what God made you sad about, and and you can you want to you know it's I, it's not a joke. It's like do you want to win an Emmy? <laughs> then everyone knows you have to pour all your passion in that direction. If you're ever going to do it, I'm just saying, what if you pour all your passion that way because you're empty of all your own stuff, and this is the way the Lord has made you to go. And you pour all your passion and direct all your passion into it. He's saying you then can inherit what's here, right? And then, and then, but always, but and then hunger and seek what is right. Like it all just keeps increasing. You're sad for this. All your passions are going, and hunger and thirst for what is what is right every day. And every day I'll feed you like manna. But don't get full. Hungry again tomorrow, empty again tomorrow, and I will fill you again tomorrow. You can't save it up. You can't store it up. It's every day to present your body living sacrifice, right? Holy and acceptable. Every day. And then remember mercy when you're doing it. Stay merciful. Don't, don't get greedy. Don't get mean. Stay merciful, right? And then in this your heart is single-minded. It's pure. It's not diluted by anything. And the way you know is you can always see God in front of you in this. You'll always see God's. And when you can't see God's presence, stop, get empty. When you lose track of where he is, when you get, when, when other issues get in there and they take away the purity of your motivation, stop. Right. And then, And then as you see God, the way you'll know is wherever you go, you're creating peace. You're not creating conflict. You're creating peace. And then you get to the level of radical love, which is you're beyond fear. You're beyond cowardice. And even if they revile you and persecute you, and it won't stop you. And so then you're at that ultimate level that Jesus says, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? It's the greatest honor. Now is the son of man glorified. Everything about he's sad for the lost. All of his passion is directed towards what he came to do. Right? He sees God in the whole awful, dark, terrible process. He's creating peace. He's filled with mercy. 
and he, he achieves what he was sent to do. It's obedience. So scripture says, blessed are the makers and the maintainers, the Amplified Bible, the maintainers of peace, for they are the sons of God. We read Romans talking about sonship. That's not gender specific. It's talking about position in Christ. That's maturity. Um, to broker the reality of peace here on earth in the midst of conflict. I think about you and Donna when you lived overseas <laughs> between Indonesia and in Baghdad. I mean, you have story after story after story, and here you are. You guys are a case study on being makers and maintainers of peace. But to do that here on earth, Jamie, like what does that, what does that require? Connect maturity to the ability to broker peace amid chaos. We walk into a meeting chaos. We walk into a relationship, chaos. You and Donna walk into uh, a hostile nation, chaos. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and do this in one minute because I can, because we're at the hour here. Um, it's number one, it's to believe that it can happen. That is number one, that peace can happen. I don't think people think it can happen. I think it's like, oh, we're just going to have conflict and that's the way it's always going to be. And so is convinced that peace can happen and and that your life, that the willingness to sacrifice your life for the sake of peace is what Jesus said could be the cost. So if we're if we're going into a situation, self-protecting and self-promoting, you already have said, I'm not all that interested in peace. I have a limited interest in peace if we can do it and it doesn't cost me anything. But um, going into it saying we acknowledge that in this situation, um, we might have to sacrifice our, our life to do it. Already you've defeated what conflict centers around, which is self-protection and self-promotion. That's it, Jamie. That's right. Right. So it's whenever, I, whenever we were in a peace negotiation my question to the people in, in the negotiation is are you willing are you willing to bless the enemy at any cost and when they say no I say, well then we're not going to have a peace negotiation like you're not interested in peace because you're already saying here's where i'm not gonna i'm gonna protect myself in this or my country or whatever and already you're like can you imagine jesus saying i'm coming to bring peace to the world as long as it doesn't you know, i don't get killed in the process then it's already over But see, that's all the way back to self-emptying again, because this belief that death is some kind of loss and failure and all of that is what continually hurts us. Any kind of death, loss of a job, loss of a relationship, we, it's all a kind of dying to us. And we, it's always considered to, devastation to us. And, and, and I think that's why Jesus weeps over Jerusalem and over the situation with Lazarus is because they think they think the, they think death is somehow a big loss. And Jesus is like, do you, you don't understand with me, you cannot die. <laughs> and if you can't die, then what in the world are you afraid of losing a job, you know, or whatever? It's like, then you're saying, well, there's only one job and you're back to scarcity. And, and so you just have to keep, it's like, you have to constantly go back. Okay. Wait, I need to empty myself of that idea. I need to empty myself. Right. And so you're always back at it. But as soon as you empty, then you're like, it's almost like organically you become, well, if I'm not afraid to die, then, well, then we could really do something about the situation of education then. And like you start mourning for the right thing. And then you start channeling your passions in that direction. And you start hungering for it and you start building relationships and you start going to God going, tell me what to do because we don't know what to do here. And then you're back in this right relationship. And you just, so every day it's self-emptying. So that's my, that's my practice going into 2024. That's so good. Uh, Jamie. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's distill this conversation down folks walking out of this. Obviously we're in this formation series. What do you want them to know? What do you want them to do? How do we best apply what you shared with us today? Um, to kind of tuck that in the, in the cove of our hearts as we continue to be formed as disciples of Jesus. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's what I'm just encouraging people to, to like ask the Lord, 
what is it that fills my heart? Like what is, what consumes me, what fills me? And really try and tell the truth on this confession, truth telling, you know, I'm filled with anxiety about money or whatever. Just get to that place. Like this is, this is filling my brain space. It's filling my heart space. It's filling my spirit. Let's okay. How do I get rid of all of that so that I can be filled with what God has created my identity to be directed towards? And then, and then when you do it, then once you're once you're in that flow of the beatitudes, then then start thinking vocationally. Where in when I'm pure of heart, when I'm empty of my own kingdom, when I'm receiving from God, what vocations? does my identity have the most freedom to be a gift to the world? And then go after them. That's what I, you know, go after those vocations. It's interesting. And I got to close with this in our group of 20 somethings. We did a dream night and I said in our group, there's 25 of them in our group. If we start speaking out, we, we emptied, we did this beautiful emptying process. Okay. God, what do you want me to be lament? What, what do you want me to be sad about in the world in terms of like vocation? And they started saying them out loud. It's really interesting. So there's a Marine in the group and he started talking about, well, you know, really, I'd, you know, I've, I've been involved in killing and I'd rather be involved in rescuing, you know, and helping human trafficking and all that. One guy is a musician and he said, I'd really, I would love to be able to do this kind of thing in music. Within two weeks of them saying it out loud after the self-emptying in the group, these opportunities started coming up in front of them. And here's the thing. I was the, I was with the Marine guy last night, and, and he's like come so alive lately. He wasn't even sure he wanted to be in the group. And I said, do you think these opportunities weren't there the whole time? They were, It's not magic. They've been there the whole time. What happened is... You couldn't see them <laughs> because you're like this in life. You're so consumed with all the wrong things. You can't see what's around you. And as soon as you empty, it's like you could just see now what's always been available. Now let's figure out how do we get to that. And, and so he starts directing his passions, right? He starts focusing his time. He starts, he starts becoming a peacemaker and he can see God. Oh, that's where God has been. Yes. That's right. He's been there the whole time. Come on, come on. That's so good. Yeah. Well, okay, and we can we can close the door on this conversation here, um, and I'll ask you if you've got anything else. But I think about Isaiah forty three. Behold, I do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Why would he ask that? It's because he's not lacking information. It's because we might actually not see it. That's right. Totally. We we know we won't see it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's Hagar in the spring, you know, you're, we're going to die. We're going to die. And, and the angel says, look over there. There's a spring of water. <laughs> you can't see it when you're going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. But when you like, no, we're not going to die. Look around. We're not going to die. Look around. And, oh, there's the spring of living water. Yeah, there it is. It's been there the whole time. Yeah. Jamie, you, uh, <laughs> you're awesome. <laughs> I, I appreciate you so much. I just, I value this conversation um, along with every other conversation we have. But um, yeah, anything else today before we let the folks go? No, I, I think that's it. Get empty, get empty. <laughs> get empty. Jamie, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me.